guests gracing us for her presence. Ms. Habiba Kahinde, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm fine. Hi. Thank you. Thanks. Really nice to see you guys again. At- so without much ado, I want to welcome Camilla Nontra. Yay! <laughs> Oh my goodness! I should I should come to you every day when I'm feeling what I need. <laughs> Correct. This is Sudan. Wow. Sudan. Believe it or not, Sudan has more pyramids than Egypt. Interesting. Yeah. Begin to think in a pan African way because they they now see that their conditions are not just about that local space, but the condition is linked to all of the. Af- Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing today? Happy New Year to you. Um, this is the Pan-Africana show. Um, I'm your co-host, Fred Nontra. Yo, my co-host, Jesse McCoy. What's going well, on, everybody? <laughs> we are glad. Another year, we're glad for God's grace, for protecting us throughout all of 2020. <clears throat> With all the challenges, we're still grateful that we are here today. We are live. It's by him we live, we move, and have our being. So, you know, find 10 things to be grateful about in 2020. This morning, my wife was just telling me about 20, 10 things she was grateful about in 2020. Yes, God was, was good to us in spite of all that happened. Um, let's not focus on all the negative. Let's look at all the good things he's done for us. All right. So, um, Jesse? Yes, um, this has been a very interesting week. Uh, for, for those of you who are watching, particularly if you're watching from outside of the United States of America, uh, you probably are How's trying to going? figure out what just happened. Hello, you hear me? Oh, I think Fred is frozen. I think we lost. So uh, if, if you are watching this from outside of the United States, you're probably trying to figure out what has happened. I know your news media has probably been uh, going crazy, going haywire. Okay, we with have some technical difficulties. Washington, D.C. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I lost you for a little bit. Back? Yeah, you're back. Oh, okay, okay. So with, with the events of, of Washington, D.C., um, for those of you who may not know, there was, I guess, an attempted coup uh, <laughs> to overthrow the uh, United States government uh, and for all intents and purposes. Uh, it looks like it failed, but I don't know if I can tell if it failed or if it was successful. Um, so anyways, if, if you haven't seen this before, one of the concerns we have is this is a time where we are experiencing a period of transition uh, between different presidential administrations uh, and we are going from what's supposed to be a, a peaceful transition from Trump administration to Biden administration, who won both the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. Um, however, <laughs> what we are also finding is we are dealing with a president who unfortunately is not willing to accept the election results and has basically ginned up his supporters and followers to think that something nefarious has happened with the elections process, uh, no matter what was sent in as far as, you know, court cases that are argued, uh, each state, even Republican control uh, departments of, edu- uh, of the election uh, still come up with the same results. I don't know where they're getting this rumor from. Uh, it seems like it's just manufactured by the Trump administration because they don't want to leave. But uh, a few days ago, they ran up into the United States Capitol building with the attempt to uh, intimidate lawmakers who are getting ready to certify the election results. Um, You also probably have seen, if you've been on Black Twitter, a lot of jokes and memes about it, because that's what we do. Uh, We laugh. So this is, uh, it's it's gonna be an ongoing investigation and an ongoing crisis. But one of the things that we are happy to understand is I think for the first time, you get to see from an international perspective uh, that many of the things that black people in America have been complaining about are true, right? <laughs> These things are yeah. true. Racism is a big deal here. Um, and there are people who are willing to overthrow a government in order to establish a dictatorship that they believe will allow them or embolden them to exercise their racist beliefs uh, mm-hmm. and, and understandings. Um, likewise, usually when you see African-American groups come out in protest like you saw over the summer, 
Uh, those protests are met, despite being peaceful, they're met with police resistance and violence. And what we see here is when people were, when white people were trying to overthrow the government, there was very little uh, resistance and violence that was implemented. In fact, there's also video of several cops who were, you know, taking pictures with the people who were coming in or who moved barricades so people could get in. Very different response uh, to a very volatile situation as opposed to what happened with black people. So we, uh, a lot of black people feel validated based on what you have seen now uh, happen in our nation's capital. Uh, we do want to send our condolences to anybody who was um, in, the, in the line of fire and who was trying to defend lawmakers or trying to exercise the appropriate proper duties as police officers and got caught up uh, in the mess. But at the same time, we also want to acknowledge some of the, the hypocrisy of how people who are actually, you know, apparently laying pipe bombs at the different um, parties, national offices and at the Capitol building and who brought weapons and all that stuff. It, it's amazing how they have been able to uh, get so far into the seat of power when other people can't even walk down the street without having rubber bullets, pepper spray, the whole nine. So uh, we see you. That wasn't the conversation that we had planned on for today. We thought this was going to be about um, the country of Kenya and you finding out everything you want to know. We have a guest, uh, Francisco Ferdinand, who uh, I believe is trying to make his way onto the show and maybe dealing with some tech issues. I'm just not sure. I'm waiting to see if he'll get in. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, how was has your new year been, sir? Well, it's been it's been great. Uh, it's been great. This new year has been. Uh, I don't know. I I I was so grateful this past Christmas and uh, New Year's. Like I don't know. I felt like so. That's why we're keeping that Christmas tree <laughs> a little longer. <laughs> so you know, after all that went through, we went through last year, it's like yeah, we keep this on. We're gonna. Try to stay happy, and uh, one way to be to stay happy is to be grateful for what you have, you know, and all the uh, friends and family that you have around that are still around. Even some might have even gotten sick, and but they're still around. It's 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 a blessing to have all of them. It's a blessing to have you around, you know, and um, <clears throat> that's how the new year has gone for me. And um, I mean, so far so good. It's uh, it's getting to that busy time of the year where um, people like to, um, people get to do their income tax returns, which oh, is yes. also a busy year. For, <laughs> oh yes, busy year, busy time for me, and um, so it's uh, it's 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 starting off well, about to get busy, busy, busy. So oh, we're grateful good. for all that, not complaining at all, after oh, all that good. we've been through. Yes. Understood. Well, yeah. If anybody who has made it through 2020, you ha you oh, have to give, give a shout out to Romel. Said Happy New Year to us, Romel. What's going oh. on, Romel? <laughs> Happy New Year to you too, Miss. And then, uh, dear Michael. Happy New Year to you, Michael. my brother. Happy New Year. <laughs> he says, "I'm right now in a meeting. Can't follow the program. Hope to watch it later on your YouTube channel." Thanks, Michael, for all your support. Yes, and, and I want to emphasize to everyone, if you have not done so already, we are now on Instagram. So make sure that uh, you go and, and check us out on Instagram. Follow us. It's at the Pan-Africana Show uh, on Instagram. So follow us, like our stuff. We'll be posting more and more content as we move forward through 2021. Uh, as, as far as 2020 goes, just to kind of put a, a conclusion to it, I think it was a very trying year. We learned a lot about ourselves. We learned a lot about the things that we miss, about uh, family connections, about vacations and travel, about uh, just basic stability and the things that we take for granted sometimes uh, as being, yeah. you know, just normal. And so what I am happy for is one, everybody who is still here within the sound of my voice, we made it. Like we did it. Yeah. We got over it. We got through it. Uh, and for some people, they're even more successful now than they were, than they would have been had we not gone through all of the <laughs> exactly. issues that we had. Especially if you Jeff Bezos. Congratulations <laughs> to, 
to you. Amazon's been killing it. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they actually made a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars in the pandemic. Absolutely. S absolutely. Sister in law. Sister in law Davis Woods says, hey, homie. Oh, just that's, that's my own. That's Selena. Hey, Selena. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so we we are oh. blessed, and we're starting off um, on on a relatively good foot. I think we're still dealing with issues of COVID internationally and how everybody's dealing with it. Uh, and now we know that there's a vaccine, at least en route in some places. Uh, hopefully, it'll yeah. be administered globally. Um, and then we also know this is just going to be a, a new year of so much promise. I think individually. It's a new opportunity for all of us to go back out here and live our best lives and uh, accomplish those things that we've already always put off, but we wanted to do. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us on a global scale to continue this mission of bridging the gap uh, between the diaspora. As you can see now, it's more important than ever, right? <laughs> that we know each yeah. other and that we talk to each other and that we are in network and communication with one another uh, to build bridges across so, you know, once the world opens back up, uh, don't be surprised if y'all see me in, in your city or whatever. Don't be surprised because <laughs> I, I got my travel list ready to go. Passport is yeah, dusted yes, off. Yes. Uh, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's important. One um, wise man I know said, um, you're not educated un until you travel because mm -hmm. traveling really educates you. And and I, and I believe that's true when you go to different parts. I mean, even if you live just in the States and you travel around to different States, you, you learn a lot, you know, I've, I mean, I've had the, I've been blessed enough to go to even Puerto Rico and it's, it's, it's still like a, what do you call it? A, a territory of the U.S. <laughs> yeah, like and Commonwealth, I think, yeah. Yeah, come on, but it's a it's a totally it feels like a totally different country, you know. And uh, I like the food and the atmosphere there. It's it's you know very warm and you know very tropical. It's like wow, you know, it was it was pretty good. So anyway, you travel around to the Caribbean, go to Africa. There's so many places to travel to Asia and wherever you you see fit to go. But definitely travel to the continent and you know there's so many honeymoon spots in like in uh, Africa like uh, first of all like uh, what do you call the place Seychelles Islands yes it's number one honeymoon spot in Africa you know you can you can you can't always be going to the Caribbean or to uh, uh, Mexico Cancun Mexico you also try go to Seychelles Island and you know have beautiful beaches and and all the great of good food. So please do so once everything opens up, but be safe. And uh, talking about the vaccine, um, one um, good friend of mine, I've seen um, a couple of my friends who work in healthcare have taken both shots. So, mm -hmm. and uh, the only issue I heard is it's a little, you feel a little pain in the shoulder that was it was administ administered in. That's the only uh, side effect that you yeah, but uh, um, with all all that's been said, it's uh, it's, it looks like it's safe. And my wife, being a scientist, she is. She said mRNA vaccine is actually you know safe for us. You know, I know all the because of the past history in the fifties mm -hmm. and all that went down. There's a lot of mistrust with the system, and rightfully so. If you a little distrust, and some people think you know they're not going to get the same. They're not going to be administered the same kind of uh, what what is being administered to the healthcare workers and to the mm. politicians. They probably you know water it down or, <laughs> or put something <laughs> in it. And, <laughs> you know, I, I I definitely feel you there because of the past and all that's gone and how um, people who look like us like us have been treated in the past, both Absolutely. here and all over the world. Absolutely. So what's your take on that, JC? <laughs> well, I, I think so. So far, my friends who are working in healthcare, I've only got one that I know took both doses. They all took the first one. And the first one, like you said, nobody yeah. had any issues, just arm pain. The second one, I had yeah. a friend of mine who got it uh, two days ago. And she said that one was a lot worse than the first. So oh, um, really? this one, yeah, I think this one caused like some aches and chills and 
stuff like that. But um, she's doing fine. Uh, everything's going well. And I know sometimes, you know, the way that vaccines work is they inject a little bit of what the virus is in you so that you can develop the antibodies that you need. And mm -hmm. if you already have those antibodies in your system, then the effect of the vaccine is usually very small. But if so you you're do not, you're not that from New Hampshire, I'll be proud of you explaining yes. the science like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If if you if you already have the antibodies, then usually you won't feel much, right? There's always going to be pain at the injection site because it's a needle going in your arm. But yeah. um, but other than that, if if you don't have them, you may get some symptoms. Right? It's not going to be the full blown disease. Yeah. I don't want people mm -hmm. to think they're going to get injected with COVID. Um, <laughs> there is some symptoms, but the purpose of those symptoms is so that your body can say, "Oh, now I know what that is," and yeah. make the appropriate antibody to protect you. So give yourself, you know, maybe like a week just to bounce back, recover, get used to it, and you'll be back in no time, able to go. Now. What we also want to talk about is just because you get the vaccine does not necessarily mean that you didn't uh, contract COVID before vaccination. So there's a lot of stories coming out about people who say, I got the vaccine, but I still got COVID. Well, if you didn't get tested, there's there's no way to know if you might have picked up COVID before the vaccine. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, we want people to be safe for those people who say, I want to wait for a while and see what happens with everybody else. I'm in the group with you. I want to wait for a while and, see, and see what happens with everybody else. And then once I see everything looks good, it's cool. Uh, I uh, I salute all healthcare workers and all scientists because I feel like they don't really have a choice in this. That's the difference between them and us. They work with people who are dealing with this on a daily basis. Yeah. And the fact that they are doing it and they're being brave enough and courageous enough to document what the experience is like for the rest of us uh, is something I don't want to take for granted. So I appreciate everybody who's doing this and who's been on the front lines fighting against COVID really since the beginning before we even knew what this was. Um, I'm also hopeful, you know, I, I hate when politics bleeds into medicine, but unfortunately, another reason why people aren't as trusting of this is because they feel it came up during a Trump administration which I understand. Like, I, I get what you're saying. So, um, you know, I, I I just want people to understand that Trump isn't the person pipetting this stuff into uh, the vial. These are companies that risk their own stock portfolio, their own um, just credibility uh, behind this. And they have scientists who are working on this. And the scientists are risking their expertise, their credibility on trying to make this work as well. So there are a lot of people, a lot of buffers of insulation before you get to Trump. I think at the very least, he's just a person that signs <laughs> a document. So I don't want y'all to think he's pipetting it in there. Um, yeah. But yeah, so definitely if, if you haven't done so already, uh, matter of fact, I, I don't know that we even can because I think there's a chain of administration yeah. as to who can get it and who can't. But uh, one of the things that we hear in the transition administration is, there's going to be a push to at least get that first shot out there and disseminated widely uh, within the United States. Uh, typically for other countries, if they see the United States doing it, it seems like they would you know, fall in line and try to do it for themselves as well. Uh, so I anticipate that everybody globally is going to be at least the first shot in by a worst case scenario, October, November of this year. That's my anticipation. Not a scientist. Yeah. I'm just guessing. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. So, like you said, it's um, so the healthcare workers, the lawmakers, and then I saw the vice president and a few. Um, I think Joe Biden. I saw him, mm -hmm. and then um, the um, vice president elect Harris. Also, mm -hmm. I saw her take the shot. So, so healthcare workers, politicians, and then. I guess uh, every everyday person. And it's going. I mean, November, December. I, I know a, a lot of people too are, gonna, are trying to stay away from it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. most people that just don't like needles. But uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a, I guess it's a necessary evil right now. That too. <laughs> well, let, could, let uh... me let me reveal this too. So <laughs> I, I was one of the people. You know, I'm skeptical all the time because yeah. of this. And what happened is my job made it a requirement. So if you work in academia and you work with students, especially if you're working with students, international students, 
they're requiring you now to get flu shots. We haven't gotten a requirement yeah. for COVID yet for the COVID vaccine, but I'm anticipating that's going to come. Um, but we definitely got a requirement <laughs> for flu shots. And I had never taken a flu shot ever in my life. So I went through, tried to do all the exceptions that we usually do, you know, religious exceptions, <laughs> everything I could go through <laughs> to not have to do it. Uh, it didn't work out. So I ended up going to take it. And what I can say now as somebody who has taken the flu shot is what I was anticipating or nervous about with this flu shot was really nothing. Once I got it, it took all of five minutes and I had zero yeah. side effects. To it. Effects, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, granted, I understand where people are coming from. But on this side, looking back, I feel like I was doing a bunch for not, <laughs> not a lot <laughs> of concern. Uh, I don't know. For the COVID vaccine, I'm anticipating that it's probably going to be similar, um, at least from what I hear from the first one. It's, like, it's nothing. So I'm anticipating that it's going to be the same. Um, and I'm anticipating that, you know, anybody who's going to be working in a capacity that where they deal with a lot of people, um, a lot of employers are going to consider making it mandatory. Now, we've already heard from the Biden um, transition team that they will not be making it mandatory. But uh, just yeah. know, you know, what he says and what your boss says <laughs> might be completely different and you need your paycheck uh, to, <laughs> to yeah. pay your bills. Um, I tried to fight it. My boss was basically like, all right, so do you want to check or not? It was like, yeah, go on ahead. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, but for you, will that mean you have to do it now since, I mean, now you don't have to go to the office or anything. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to school. You do every, all your training, all your classes are on Zoom, right? So, so we again. we have the option, right? I, I've opted for all my classes for the entire academic year to be virtual, um, but yeah. not every teacher does that, and there are reasons why. I mean, there is a lot. The typically the bigger your class is, the harder it is to do virtual because you can't keep up with a hundred students. Uh, my classes yeah. tend to be relatively small, so everybody has internet access. It's not a problem. Um, Tisha, hey, what's going on? Tisha, uh, I work with oh, older average yeah. people, so I'm sure it'll be something we need. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you're going to do virtual, the way that they um, set it up, at least at my institution, is as long as you are virtual and you can guarantee that you are not going to be in direct um, space with any other students or any other faculty or whatever, then you're fine. The problem, yeah. though, is I am not just a traditional professor. I am a clinical professor, which means... I have court responsibilities in addition to my, my academic training. So yeah. because I have court responsibilities, I have to be around people. And my court system has zero protections from, from COVID. <laughs> like, so what? <laughs> like, suck it up and come in and deal with court with the rest of us. So, um, yeah. so yeah, that causes, you know, students who want to be in my class take cases as well. So if they're going to be out there, then we have to make sure that we've protected ourselves uh, to the best of our ability. Um, mainly because I, you know, deal with people's kids, and I don't want people's kids getting sick uh, yeah. <laughs> because they were trying to get a good grade in my class, right? So, um, so yeah, we we get the option, and um, the flu shot was the one thing that became compulsory if we were going to continue to operate in that manner, which I don't really have a choice in that because I have to. Um, but you know, oh, with that yeah. said, I think it's a good look for everybody because the flu is. You know, it kills people, too. And the flu is one mm -hmm. of those things where it changes quite frequently. There are different strains of the flu. Uh, they recommend that you get one annually just to make sure yeah. that you're good. Um, I have never, as far as I know, have never gotten the flu. Uh, so I'm anticipating that's probably why when I got the shot, I didn't have any kind of effect because I probably have already had the antibodies. Um, yeah. but I have got a number of other shots, <laughs> so there's no telling what the other, you know, what that mixture has done, uh, to my system. Uh, not to mention, I feel like I put myself, I, I don't treat myself where I didn't until 2021 treat my body as a temple, like I should. So, uh, eating whatever I wanted to eat, I'm sure that created some resistance to some, some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, 
yeah so like so like you said um yeah i i also had my doubts about the flu shot and stuff but um uh, one time i went for a physical and the doctor just said uh just take it he recommended that i took it i mean he did not force me but he recommended that i took it so and i took it and there was nothing and because i do know that in the past i did get a flu before mm. in the past yeah and uh, it's the same way with um and even with us who come from um places of uh, infectious disease like in ghana when we're growing up we we have uh i forget the name of it but we we have a sh we have all kinds of shots so like when we come here they give us the skin test the the skin test for um tuberculosis mm -hmm. and usually we have a positive response because of the antibodies we have against it so when that happens and the the first time i came here that happened and they were like oh uh you must have <laughs> tuberculosis they're for, trying to force me to take the the pills and like no way i even threw it away i'm not gonna take take those shots because of where i came from because my chest they did a chest x-ray x-ray and i was i was clean mm -hmm. you know so they call it um uh pp pp something I forget, I forget it's been a while since i mm -hmm. i took that but if you work in healthcare you have to take that skin test I don't know what you know what I'm talking about. Where they inject, they push, they inject something into your arm, and if there's a reaction, it means you might have it. I, I've heard of it. I don't think I've ever had it, but I've, I've yeah. heard of it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Letitia says gas station food will boost your immune system or kill you. <laughs> <laughs> She's not wrong. <laughs> She's not wrong. <laughs> She's not oh, wrong. Oh my yes. goodness. <laughs> now they do she have new be, age gas stations now because the, the Wawa's and the sheets and all the stuff they come up with now, that food is good. But yeah, I oh, remember you, the old school egg Wawa, sandwiches. Yeah, Wawa in the Carolinas. <laughs> we have yeah, sheets Wawa. in the Carolinas. We got Wawa's. Anytime I go to New Jersey, we usually stop at Wawa's Wawa along the way. Wawa. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I miss about Philly because they have the Wi-Fi. <laughs> they have all the <laughs> cheese steaks. They have all the food. Yes. Yeah, they have uh, some chicken strips and all that stuff. <laughs> yes, Wawa's. So, yeah. If you are listening and you need sponsorship, <laughs> make sure you sponsor us, Wawa's, because uh, I love Wawa's. The cheese steaks are great, um, and and it's always nice to have. Like you know, you stop in. I remember back in the day, you used to go to the corner store, and if you tried to get the actual groceries at least down here in north carolina you were dealing with pickle pig feet um they usually would have like the little devil eggs in the big old jar that everybody <laughs> put their hands in i don't know why we thought that was safe um they had you know, like candies and then they had like these like rolly hot dogs where they just keep hot dogs on a hot roll and keep them spinning and everybody reaches in, no gloves. Just get, let's get out of So all that stuff has changed now because clearly in a COVID-19 world, that's not going to fly. Um, yeah. What she say? Convenience store, chicken strips, and cheese steaks. Y'all trying to die. <laughs> <laughs> My wives, yeah. they're great. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's just once in once a while. So, I mean, I believe in, uh, you know, Doing doing all these things in moderation, you know, you know, you can't be doing it every day. But yeah, but then I used to work right across when I was a student. I worked at a car wash. I worked right across a Wawa, so that was breakfast, lunch. <laughs> we used to get that almost every day. So absolutely. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I mean, we kept we kept busy. So I guess because we were fit, so we don't really get sick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, but I so, feel you. Yeah, yeah. The the key. I mean, you're right. It's moderation. You. It's moderation. We got to take care of ourselves. I'm hoping everybody listening in 2021 uh, is going to take care of themselves. Uh, I just got a message from Francisco. He is trying to get in. Should be in within the next 10 minutes. He said. Um, oh, he's he's in soon now. Yeah. So, wow. uh, Letitia, Letitia, yeah. she's on fire today. Your grandchildren are going to be. Immune to everything, or will be Superman. <laughs> hey, that's <laughs> I don't know how we got as far as we did, but the most immunity we can get. If we all I need now is immunity to white supremacy, and I think we'll be good, <laughs> be good to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, you know, I think um, 2021, if you're listening, I think it's a good opportunity for those of you who've been putting diet and an exercise on the back burner. I know how it is, especially coming off of November and December uh, with Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, it's a good time to start over and hit restart. So that's that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm starting over. I've been trying to do this intermittent fasting. Um, I am. I haven't really got back into the swing of working out like I need to, but yeah. uh, that's, that's the plan next. Now that I got the diet somewhat in a sustainable position, uh, and you know, we just got to get through because we need each and every one of us to be here <laughs> so that we can continue to progress and develop. Uh, our kids need us. Our spouses need us. And the last thing we want to do is be out of here for some avoidable reason that we could have uh, planned for. See, I don't get sick either, but getting older, I had to cut older, that out. I had to yeah. cut that out. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, uh, me too, I cut a lot of things out. I don't like, I don't use any potato chips anymore. I don't like this <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I try to cut, you know, a lot of things out. You know, like you said, the hot dogs and like, nah, I stay away from all the processed stuff. That's what gets us in trouble. And yeah. uh, she said, "What amen? White supremacy will put out will put yes. out pressure." <laughs> yes. yes, yes, that's true. Absolutely. I remember getting so upset last. Like I just thought about how the Black Lives Matter was demonized over the summer, and you know, calls all kinds of names. And I mean, a lot of times, people just stood there or just marched peacefully, and mm -hmm. were were you know gassed and all kinds of things where you know tear gas and rubber bullets were thrown their way so like to 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 see the double standards and the as lebron called it two different americas it was disturbing but um mm -hmm. but the funny thing is most of our brothers and sisters just joked about it. it's like oh that's not my fight i'm going to work out <laughs> my, my. <laughs> <laughs> i saw someone say that <laughs> like, oh, so these people are crazy uh, yeah. i'm going to work out that's not my fight <laughs> What what's so, interesting is yeah. it was it was police and basically white supremacist Trump supporters who are are engaged in this battle, if you will, on Washington. Yeah. And I and I've literally asked the legit question on Facebook when this was going down. I was like, "Who do we cheer for?" <laughs> it's like, like, "Who do I cheer for?" Because you know our protests over the summer were against bad policing, and um, you know I never could cheer for a white supremacist. So. Who do, what do I do? And so I just popped a bag of popcorn, sat down, <laughs> watched everything, and waited on Black Twitter to come through with the memes. Uh, and they did not disappoint. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we even saw Sister Tamika Mallory, uh, you know, who's been doing a wonderful job. Uh, we saw her yeah. say, you know, Black people, this this ain't your fight. Just just stay home, enjoy, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you know. We, you know, it things like this are bound to happen. I think one of the things we also need to appreciate is with the Black Lives Matter movement. I feel like black people were protesting a real issue. We were protesting the fact that police were killing us with no justification whatsoever. And I think these people in Washington are protesting because they didn't the election didn't go their way. So that seems like a very yeah. different standard uh, to be protesting. And it makes them very hypocritical when they were criticizing people like Colin Kaepernick for taking the knee during the anthem, saying that wasn't patriotic, yeah. but they're trying to attack congressmen. So, you know, to each his own, though. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what got me upset about that is I, I brought it up to a guy who was a military guy, and I told him that's nothing to do with the flag. And I told them, I um, we kneel down. We, we are um, spiritual people, religious people, if you want to call it. We kneel down when we go to church to God, and He's more honorable than the American flag. We can honor. We have to honor Him higher, way higher than the American flag, and we kneel to Him. And so, if He's kneeling down, that's even a sign of honor. He was He was mm -hmm. sitting, but because the the military, his um, his friend, the military, a former um, U.S. I think it was in the army of uh, Marines. I don't remember, but this this guy came to speak to him and told him at least kneel down because when they lose a fellow soldier, they kneel down with a flag in their hand. So at least if you kneel down, it's a sign of honor. So the big deal about him kneeling down or standing 
it didn't make any sense to me, <laughs> you know. So, but Colin Kaepernick uh, has got his, uh, he got a last laugh now. Now he's being honored for his bravery and all that he did for us. So, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Well, just to set a tone here before uh, Francisco joins us. So, our topic today was going to be about the wonderful country of Kenya. And I know for Kenya. a lot of people in America, um, when we think about Kenya, we think about long distance running because it seems like they just have the cornerstone on long distance running. We think it's about, a yes, yes. <laughs> we, we think about um, Nairobi. Um, some of you may remember Mombasa. Uh, I always, you know, just so y'all know, I secretly get on Google Maps every day and Google Mombasa just to see a city on the beach, like just like, just to see what it's like <laughs> to be able to walk out of an office building at five o'clock and yeah. just be on the beach. Um, when Periscope was jumping, I used to follow people from Mombasa just to see their life when they would come out and be on boats and enjoying life. It just looks like, you know, just, it just looked to me like black heaven, right? Black people on the beach, black yeah. people working, black people in boats, like going out doing all kinds of water sports. Um, so I, I'm curious about that. Uh, Francisco Ferdinand, who is going to be joining us soon, is from Nairobi. And Nairobi, I used to follow people there, too. Um, they had a lot of developing markets. I don't know if it's still like that, but a lot of developing markets in the, I guess, early 2015, 2016 period. Uh, and those markets were catering to people from out of country to come in and build things like networks and energy grids and things like that um, to move everything into the next century. And I followed a lot of people who were in the tech program and a lot of people who were doing um, even like social stuff, like setting up parties and stuff like that. So I am excited uh, to hear from somebody who is actually actually has boots on the ground in Nairobi and can tell us a little bit about what the country is doing, uh, how the country is, where the spots are for those of y'all who want to go visit uh, and give us a little bit of background on that. So uh, he ran some issues, but he is on the way. Uh, and I am excited about this. I have I've had, before we got into this podcast, I, I had Kenya as number three on my list. Okay. I have talked to other black people from other places and I don't know where I'm putting Kenya now. I know Ghana's number one. So Ghana is where I'm going first. <laughs> uh, I've got a large uh, number of friends in South Africa who are pushing for South Africa to be higher. Um, it wasn't high for me. So, so, so they have to put in that advocacy to really get it up there. Uh, and I'm coming from America. So, I, you know, the way my savings and check-ins are set up, I'm not going to be able to do it all, right? <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do what I can. Uh, when I can, but Ghana is number one, Nigeria definitely, uh, and then I had Kenya at three. I don't know if Francisco's gonna drop something on me today that's gonna say, okay, let me boost Kenya up to number two. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Mike, Mike is gonna be mad at you. Mike's gonna be mad. <laughs> yeah, yes. but uh, that's a good order, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, they, yeah, they do have great wine, but they they still very it's very far to get down there. And uh, absolutely, yep. Yeah, they also have a high um, what do you call it? It's I mean, not now. I mean, hopefully things get better. I think they're the worst in Africa as hard as hit with the COVID situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and a, a lot more people, and that's because most of Africa's a lot of people got. It. I mean, the people, all the most of the people who got it were asymptomatic. You know. And, uh, you know, I mean, thank God for the sun, for the uh, natural vitamin D Absolutely. that we get. And, you know, because I heard that's, I mean, that's one of the, I mean, according to research, that's one of the things that hurt people is their um, lack of vitamin D, mm -hmm. the vitamin D deficiency when people have the issues. So do take your vitamin D if in a cold area. I know you don't get enough sun. You live in the Northeast. Or the east, like uh, <laughs> like Jesse, all the way up. <laughs> take, take a thousand. I think it's uh, five thousand IU. I think mm. of, uh, vitamin D. Make sure you take it, and uh, so you have your extra vitamin. Your, your immune system is fortified, 
against any yeah. foreign enemies, Don't, <laughs> foreign <laughs> domestic enemies. <laughs> yes, we definitely need it. We definitely need it. And see, usually I get that on vacation over the summer. I go to Florida, or I go to the Caribbean or whatever the case may be, but I haven't been able to do that. So because I haven't been able to do that, uh, I know that I'm probably deficient because I have <laughs> been in the <laughs> sun. I've been in front of the computer. Um, let's see. Oh, South Africa has great wine. See, yeah. we're getting people shouting out South Africa. So I'm, <laughs> I might even just open up. I know on Instagram, I'm able to do polling. I might just open up a poll and have people yeah. vote on where where I should go. And then I'll try to document when I start traveling, once this, once outside opens up again, I'll start yeah. documenting my travels um, so y'all can see. And I can either give you thumbs up or I can give you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let's see what, what she says now. She says, I'm going to help, I'm going to help Jesse stretch his traveling dollar. I found trip to Iceland from California for $540. I can get Jesse to top to top three. <laughs> he might not be able to do anything while he's there, but we'll we'll be all right. Iceland, hey, Leticia? Oh it? my goodness! I, Even I in uh, the right? It, do they have um? Is that I get Iceland and Greenland confused? One of them is very Iceland. cold. It's close. Yeah, Iceland. I don't remember whether it's by the Arctic. I can let me uh, go and mute. Yeah. I get it confused. And then one of them has, I think it's like a um, black sand beach. I don't know if it's Greenland because I know somebody who's been to one of those places. I don't know if it's Greenland or Iceland. Now, what okay, I don't it's not, know. It's not, um, it's not by the Arctic, but it's really cold out there too. So Okay. That's well, an island. Yeah. Sound <laughs> less like vacation. <laughs> Greenland. Okay. She's saying Greenland is all ice and Iceland has green parts. Green parts. Yeah. Okay. So they must have did that intentionally to confuse us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know any black people in Iceland or Greenland. I know a black person who has been to one of them, um, but I don't know if they have black people. So if you are black and you're from Iceland or Greenland, make sure that you follow us or hit us up on Instagram. And let us know so we can uh, have you on the show. Uh, I haven't been there. COVID converted. COVID. Yeah. Let's just let you should go visit, visit the motherland. Uh, yes. The shells. There's Ghana. There's Nigeria. There's um, uh, democratic Senegal. Senegal. All kinds of cool places on the continent, and um, they have a lot of. Uh, uh, vacation spots, and especially Seychelles. There's also Equatorial Guinea, Sao Tome, and all those cool parts. They have all these islands, Madagascar, Mauritius, you know, very beautiful places with unique scenery and unique wildlife. If you like wildlife, that would be a good place to go. And, and now we, uh, we have the guest of honor <laughs> in the show, Francisco Ferdinand. How you doing, man? Fine, thanks. How are you doing, everyone? And uh, we're doing well. me over here. Ah, no problem. No problem. Well, we, we've been sitting here talking about different countries in Africa. We're trying to promote tourism, and I'm trying to develop my list of where I should go when I when outside opens back up and yeah. we can go places. Kenya right. was number three for me, right? <laughs> so I'm, so I'm trying, I wonder so I'm why we were not number one, though. <laughs> well, well, Ghana was number one, but that that's yeah. a bigger issue. I, I think Ghana, my mom used to live in there. So yeah. I wanted to go to Ghana just to kind of see what it's like. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I had Nigeria number two because oh, wow. one of our uh, frequent viewers, Michael, good friend of mine, is mm -hmm. uh, is from Nigeria, and he hyped me up for a goosey soup. <laughs> so, so I'm ready to go. And then <laughs> I always... I always wanted to go to Kenya, and I'll tell you why. I told the listeners that I look. I used to go on Google Earth, mm -hmm. and I would look at Mombasa. It's right. just a city on the beach, and I would see beautiful black people on the beach in yachts and everything. And I said, this is black heaven. I've never seen anything like this. I want to go to Mombasa and live the yacht life on the, on the beach. Right, right, right. <laughs> 
Well, I'll give it to you. Like Mombasa is uh, obviously one of Kenya's, you know, delights, and uh, even Kenyans themselves, you know, want to go to Mombasa. It's kind of like how everyone wants to go to Florida or uh, Miami during the spring break because it's it's both a mix of culture and the spice of basically fun beach life. Because the culture, it's, it's one of Kenya's oldest cities, if you can say that, because it was developed as a trading port, um, Indian Ocean, very uh, lucrative business back in the day, obviously of slave, slaves and ivory from the hinterland going into, you know, the Middle East back then. And also Zanzibar, which is, you know, just an island off Tanzania was uh, where the Sultanate was. So Mombasa yeah. was this just, you know, um, it was, if you could say, it was a, a center where the Sultanate could also operate from. And as a lucrative trading post, it, it definitely had its share of both business and administration uh, capacity. But no, as time has progressed, uh, Kenya obviously has used it as a shipping port and uh, it's become also a key administrative area for the coastal region. So it's definitely a go-to place, both in terms of if you want to see culture, but also if the people there are very hospitable, uh, a mix and a blend of Arabic and Bantu culture. So that's oh, wow. where the origins of Swahili actually are. The language is oh, a mix. Wow. And a, a fusion of the of the Arab traders who used to come in uh, from you know the Arab countries and into the hinterland, and they had this Bantu languages. So the mesh of the two created Swahili, and um, it's what now became one of our official languages in Kenya. And so this is part of just the heritage and the culture that we enjoy. So when you talk about Kenya and Mombasa specifically, you're right on the mark, brother. Oh, oh wow! <laughs> I think you're oh. moving up, Mike. You got competition in that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, Francisco, that's that's interesting. That's an interesting city. I always uh, wondered about how the origins of the Swahili because um, of the Arab influence. Because in um, in in West in West Africa too, we have uh, a lot of people who speak Hausa, which also has some Arabic. Um, influence yeah. in there. They have some some uh, you know phrases and words that stem mm -hmm. from Arabic, and I know it's also from back in the day, uh, ancient Ghana, ancient uh, Mali, when right. we had all the the Arab influence come there. Mm -hmm. So, thanks for the little education. But uh, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. I know things got a little tight, but uh, thanks mm -hmm. for joining us. I'm a I'm a big fan of. Uh, one of my the people I studied in history was Jomo Kenyatta. Yes, and uh, and then the uh, Kikuyus and the Mau Mau uh, uprising. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, could you talk a little bit about um, Jomo Kenyatta? Well, yes, obviously, as I said, uh, as you know him, obviously he's one of the major you know, luminaries in the Pan-African movement. And obviously as, our, as a country, we regard him as the founding father of our nation. Of course, all this under historical, you know, revisionism is changing and there's many people who have different, you know, views about yeah. the yeah. But uh, generally, Jomo Kenyatta was the first uh, president of Kenya. And uh, his humble background is in uh, the Central Highlands, which is one of the regions in, in Kenya, Central Province. We had, before the 2010 constitutional changes, which changed provinces into counties, uh, we would call the region where he came from the Central Province. And um, a humble man, he grew up into one of the people who would of course, get the benefit of colonial education, and he would be again taken on to be one of the secretaries under the uh, the colonial um, enterprise, I would call it. And basically, this education is what gave him uh, basically a platform to join some of the uh, uh, pre the colon uh, at that time the pre independence um, African nationalist movements, and so he was again selected by the members of then what was called the. Uh, Kenya African Study Union to go to England to present to represent the, the the organization in many of the forums in which the Pan African movement had already started, you know, uh, agitating for more self self rule for more of the black colonies. And during this time that he was there, again he he gained prominence. And uh, there's also a bit of history that's not. Uh, 
uh, uh, shared about him, but he acted in a movie. Uh, oh, really? I never knew that. <laughs> movie on YouTube and so on. One of the things that I found in President World was like, you know, he was actually uh, cast on a movie when, <laughs> during this time. Uh, okay. But basically during this time, uh, while he was there, he represented the views of uh, the mainly Kikuyu, uh, which is the ethnic tribe at that time that had suffered the brunt of colonization the most yeah. because their, uh, their land was taken in by the colonialist enterprise for farming of coffee uh, and, and tea, which at that time also was a major cash crop for the uh, colonial enterprise. And so during this time, he obviously, you know, represents the plight of Kenyans and represents the plight of many of the, the other tribes and other countries in Africa that, uh, I mean, at that time also uh, agitating for self-rule. But uh, as fate would have it, you know, he, he again gets married to an English lady and there's that story again. As, I, as, as I'm peppering up the story with the revisionist history, there's, yeah. there's the official narrative where, you know, he was the all moral high up, you know, up there. We, we, we should esteem him for, you know, granting us independence. But I'm, I'm giving it wrong. And uh, <laughs> that's yeah. the pleasure of being a third generation Kenyan in terms of, our grandparents experienced colonialism, our parents experienced the independence, but we get to say it from both angles without, you know, the the veneer of either the colonialist narrative or the just post-independence narrative, um, you know, sort of holding us back. And anyway, he comes back to Kenya and uh, during the same time, there's a popular uprising, the, uh, uh, the guerrilla warfare under the Mau Mau, uh, yeah. which is a result of them, the same tribe, the Kikuyu, seeing that all these diplomatic uh, efforts were not bearing fruit, and so they take to guerrilla warfare. And at first, it's a, uh, it's it's very sensational because they're going after the loyalists, the the, the Kikuyu who wanted to be, um, you know, together with the British at that time. And a uh, famous chief who was a collaborator is is br brutally murdered, yeah. and this you know, casts aspersions again on, you know, all the Kikuyu who were living in the, in the then capital city, Nairobi. Remember Nairobi at that time was just a trading post and, you know, because the railway, which was the initial, um, if I could say the initial infrastructure that would open up the, 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 the hinterland to British exploration and then further um, exploitation <laughs> uh, was, was passing through Nairobi. And, and, and over time it became, you know, the, the city where uh, the British would extend their mandate into uh, the then British East Africa Protectorate. So in Nairobi, uh, there was a hierarchy, obviously the British, the white European settlers were the higher class and then there would be the Indians and then probably other other races would have obviously a bit of um, the Somalis, the other races that were coming in even from the Boers from South Africa. Some and then the Africans would obviously occupy bottom tier, and so they uh, they would be like mostly Kikuyu because they were from the neighboring province that surrounded Nairobi, and so these were the first people to be suspected of being you know Mau Mau um, you know oath takers because Mau Mau at that time. Uh, Etymology of the word is still, you know, you know, it has many. There, there are many uh, ways of looking at it. First of all, there's a Swahili uh, version, which is, I, I said uh, phonetically, it's Mzungu. That's a M A N D A U uh, Uingereza. That means the white man goes back to Europe or to England. Oh. M A U, and then Mwafrika. Apate Uhuru, the African gets Uhuru, so that's Mao Mao. Uh, Kikuyu, uh, you know, historians would go ahead and say, you know, there's a bit of that that, that doesn't exactly represent what the word meant because uh, in Kikuyu, there was the oath was called Uma Uma. So taking an Uma was, you know, was the, the sort of signature going into the Mau Mau, like you'd have to take an oath to protect the land and to protect, you know, the sanctity of what their forefathers left, the Kikuyu nation. And in, in fact, it's very interesting when you read some of their, uh, their, their records, there would be, there would, for example, if they were doing this guerrilla warfare and they would be in the forest, um, if you met 
you would know who's Mao Mao or who's the collaborator. So if you met each other in the forest, maybe you're, you're, you're a lady going to fetch firewood and to go back to your forest. So what you would do is you'd have to pick up some of the soil and actually lick it. And if the other person did the same, then you'd know, okay, he's Mao Mao and we're all safe. But if you didn't know what that meant, man, it was either a machete or, a, or an arrow straight, you know, to your heart. So it was that text, it was, it, was, it, was, it was that literal in terms of, you know, you couldn't tell who was who. And some historians have almost thought of it as a civil war between the Kikuyu from the collaborators and the, the, and the loyalists being hounded by the Kikuyus who did not, you know, appreciate the uh, colonial enterprise and the presence of the British in, in their farms. Other etymologists have talked about it being um, uh, the, the Mau Mau coming from a Kamba word, where the Kamba is another ethnic tribe, and which had also participated in some form of revolt earlier before the Mau Mau. And the word uh, Mau means grandfather. So meaning uh, these people were saying like, you know, the, 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 the land belongs to our fathers or to our grandfathers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's, as I said, there's variations to this. But the Mao Mao themselves, from some of the writings, again, found from the, uh, the major, you know, generals and field marshals, they didn't actually call themselves the Mao Mao. They called themselves the Kenya Land Freedom Act or the KLFA. That's what they, 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 they were fighting for, the, the, the Freedom Army, rather, not Act. And so they would call themselves a Freedom Army. And from some of their writings, it's, re it's rarely that they would call themselves the Mao Mao. A famous uh, general is Field Marshal Dedan Kimathi. And it's only until his capture, I think in 56, that then the, the movement sort of so slowly died down. But before that, the, the British had really a hard time in catching them because the warfare was none like they, have, they had been used to. Yeah. You remember they're coming from the Second World War where it was organized regiments and, brig uh, and, and, and brigades against each other. Now it's guerrilla warfare. It's, it's people who, you know, ethnically abound by the same uh, narrative where, you know, we want to get rid of the white man and the people within the British uh, ranks, the, what, what, what they would call the home guards, the loyalists, you know, have no idea of how to get into the villages and to fish out, so to speak, the, the, the people who were helping the Mau Maus. And this would be from the little kids who would sneak out with food to the forest to give them, or who would be the, who'd, who'd call out uh, in terms of warning signals, it's, you know, like the, the British were coming. And I mean, this was all done, again, in very good coordination. Or the women who, would, as they're going to fetch out firewood, would go and lay some you know, parcels of food or, you know, parcels of medicine or parcels of clothes so that these people would be warm because the forested areas where they would hide were very cold. Mm -hmm. And it's probably uh, until what the British uh, did, which is called the villagialization, which was like making of protection, protected enclaves where all the Kikui would no longer live um, in sort of a freehold system, but live in sort of protected villages that uh, this supply chain was cut. And they would barricade these villages and they would have, you know, very strong, you know, ramparts around the villages so that, you know, the Mau Mau could not sneak in and come out. And also, uh, they changed their tactics as well because uh, guided by, um, uh, can I say, an anthropologist who tried to understand the Kikuyu and realized that as the British were going into the forest because they would obviously have washed or bathed, the, the Mau Mau would smell them actually because <laughs> you know, yes. this is a different scent. So they would be miles away by the time, you know, the first uh, British uh, soldiers would be getting to whatever hideouts they were in. And so they changed their, their, their tactics and, you know, started, you know, putting on maybe animal fart and this would, uh, you know, disguise them and, 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 and leave the Mau Mau not to be able to see them. Also, they embarked on a huge air, air, air bombing campaign and, um, Approximately, I think, 900 bombs were, were, were dropped in the air uh, wow. in, from a forest, uh, the Abadea Ranges, which was most famous for hosting this Mau Mau. Also, as well, there were some informers within the ranks, and once um, one of the famous generals to have been caught and again to have released a lot of the information, he was called General China. Um, 
again, release a lot of the Mau Mau uh, battle formations and, and strategies to the British. Again, as I said, it's the, it's the capture and, and uh, 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 again, subsequent uh, judging and, and, and hanging of the Field Marshal Dedan Kimathi, who is considered Kimati, by many yeah. Yeah, as, as one of the liberation heroes. And his grave still remains unmarked, unfortunately, to this day. But there's a monument in one of Nairobi's central streets that's obviously Dead on Kimathi Street that has, uh, you know, holds this honor. And, and, and it's a timeless, you know, uh, remem uh, mom moment, a memento of, of, of the sacrifice he had for this country. And so it's upon his capture that sort of the movement died down. And uh, again, uh, we have. Obviously, other side activities that are happening. Jomo Kenyatta at this time is is he's also arrested, uh, and uh, among among the people who are arrested with him are six other luminaries from other communities who are head, heading the political uh, movement at that time. Because at that time, the, the the misconception was that Jomo Kenyatta was the leader of Mamao Mao, but actually he was. You see, so he was he was he was a straight out from Britain, and he had been given leadership of the pol the popular po political uh, uh, movement at that time led, uh, that was leading the Kikuyus, who were more educated and and, and had more opportunities to be in the city. And from what people thought that the Mao Mao was the military wing of this uh, outfit, yet it wasn't. It was just again uh, other people who had figured out that you know we won't get any form of uh, uh, a solution from diplomatic means when negotiating with the British, we have to go to war. Um, and so basically when uh, uh, he's in prison with who are the famous Kapenguria six, so the, the prisoner's name was Kapenguria and the six others or the luminaries are said from these other ethnic tribes. Um, that's when Jomo Kenyatta obviously gets a worldwide acclaim and, and there's all these calls for him to be released. And um, it's, Upon, I think in 50s, when there's a state of emergency as well that was put when the Mau Mau uprising started, uh, that was in 52. A new governor had to be sent and he, one of the measures he did was institute that state of emergency. So when it was lifted, and uh, I mean, the clamor for self-rule had reached fever pitch and the British empire was collapsing all around. That's when they started again negotiations with the likes of Kenyatta and, uh, uh, and, the, and the political organizations that were there at that time. And this led to what's called the Lancaster Conference, where again, they went to, to, to Britain and they tried to sort of form a constitution for a newly uh, independent Kenya or how a newly independent Kenya would, would be under itself. And so then Kenyatta again, you know, uh, at that time uh, is in the limelight because he's seen as to be the potential leader. So he's given a prime minister post and Kenya as it achieves self-rule in 63. Uh, he, he again gets to be the president after the governor, of course, uh, leaves and the union jerk is lowered down. And so he becomes president. And uh, one of the things that he does and he's credited for is uh, extending an olive branch to the white settlers. And these are the people obviously at that time who had more of the resources, more of the land and more of the means of production and, and, the, and the tools and the, and the technical know-how. And so for many uh, the African countries that had this, you know, the cut ranks with the, with the colonizers and, you know, chased any of them, Kenya is considered, uh, you know, an exception because he let some of them stay and uh, alongside many of the, of this, um, colonial uh, relics we have now. It, there were some members of of, of this uh, settlers who were in the in the in the, in the, in the initial cabinet, and one of them, a notable one, who was a minister of agriculture, his name is Bruce Mackenzie, was also very you know uh, he 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 was very uh, if I could say instrumental in having Kenya be very self reliant and uh, be able to be a. a you know, food security wise, uh, you know, be self-reliant. And a lot of the initial years of uh, independence, Kenya was, you know, one of the sort of the, the trophy countries of yeah. having, you know, dropped off the colonial shackles, but still being prosperous. Because a lot of other countries fell into uh, maybe coups and that kind of thing immediately after, because the scramble for power was too great. And um, he held on to power until 78 in August, where he uh, passed on, actually in Mombasa. And, uh, and uh, after that is when President Moy uh, took on to reign again for an extra 24 years. Um, 
then the clamor for multi-party democracy in 1992, again, uh, reached fever pitch and, you know, there were a lot of protests and, and uh, you remember this is the fall of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the end of the Cold War, there's a lot of, you know, global uh, geographic interests are also shifting and, and Kenya was in the middle of all this, there was the multi-party, uh, there was under the space for the, the the need for opening up the democratic space and so that's where we get again Moi taking another term but he only gets to rule for two terms because now the constitution again had gone through some changes where the president was only getting two presidential terms and then in 1990 uh in, in 2002 we get um our previous president president Moi Kibaki and he's also, you know, seen as one of Kenya's greater presidents because, again, he opened up room for reform and for democratic progress and a lot of infrastructural developments, a lot of, uh, you know, great uh, transport infrastructure, for instance, are some of his legacy projects. And he ruled again uh, for, again, two terms. And in 2013, we get uh, the president, current president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, and his He's the son of obviously the first president and a lot of people are, who I've met from, you know, other countries who knew the first Kenya are like, is Kenya a monarchy? And <laughs> we're still asking ourselves the same question because now it's election season and people are like, and the dynasty, and it's like a rallying call of one of the other um, presidential contestants. So there's a dynasty versus, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a independent, uh, 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 let's say candidates. So it's all about the mishmash of democracy in Africa. And for a lot of people, some of them have considered Kenya's case of democracy be a unique one, because of obviously there's the ethnic blocks. And as I mentioned, the Kikuyu are the major and the and the most uh, populous tribe. Yeah. And they end up obviously having this great uh, uh, swing or the ability to 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 determine who becomes the next leader. But then for a lot of Kenyan tribes that feel they're underrepresented, there's this need, okay, we need a different leader from the predominant Kikuyu tribe. Uh, but these are all, you know, as I said, local politics, but uh, we hope that the election season 2022, uh, you know, people will definitely uh, vote for the right leaders. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So it's a history, history lesson right there. Thank you so much. That's and cool. Logan on uh, from Periscope says, this is amazing. Thank you for thank you for teaching me this. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Logan. And then uh, there's a Facebook user. I'm not sure whether it's Kichi or one of our, our Friscope uh, brothers or sisters. So he's, hey, guys. Hello, Facebook user. All right, Jesse. Well, you know, I've, I've got questions um, mainly because on this side, we don't get a lot of, we don't get any of the information that you just gave us. It's <laughs> great. Uh, but we don't get a lot of information about Kenya in general, typically until Olympic season. So one of my favorite pastimes is I root for every black person that I see in the Olympics. And we know <laughs> that with long distance running, the person from Kenya is going to win, right? Yeah. So this is who we root for. But I'm just curious, like what what makes Kenya so special when it comes to long distance running? Uh, what other sports are there that Kenyans are dominating? Uh, and what what is life like just a normal day for you? Uh, I think you're in Nairobi, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is the normal thing you mentioned is uh, long distance running and. Uh, I just have to get, let's just straight off the bat, let me talk about Kenya and the number of tribes there is. So there's about 43 tribes. And wow. uh, one of the interesting things was that we had, as I mentioned, through the colonial enterprise, we had Indians coming in to build a railway. So the Kenyan Indians are a tribe upon themselves. And this was gazetted last year by the president who now made Kenyan Indians a tribe by themselves. So this is very, it was very fun news for a lot of the Indians who, you know, shuffle between the identity. Are we Indian? Are we Kenyan? Because, hey, my grandpa was here since the 1900s. I don't know anyone in you know, in Bengal or whatever. Right. In India. Yeah, but, you know, I speak fluent Swahili. I, I, I prefer most of the Kenyan stuff. When I go to India, I'm lost, you know. Yeah. So they finally get this form of uh, identity. And out of the 43, now 44 tribes, we have some of the tribes that are um, 
resident in what was previously called the Rift Valley province. Basically, it's a region where the Rift Valley cuts across. So the Great uh, Rift Valley comes all the way from Jordan, cutting through the Red Sea, splits up into uh, uh, a bit of it goes into Ethiopia, the rest of it comes all the way down into Kenya. And again, it splits down where you get the Lake Tanganyika is actually inside the Rift Valley, and some of it goes into Tanzania. So within this escarpment are some of the most interesting traps the maasai you're familiar with the maasai and yes, you know, the, the 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 historical you know uh, narratives say that you know god let us down from the from the skies and put us on the escarpment and so a lot of these things demonstrate the knowledge of you know geographic formations but then you know it's inter twined with culture and you're like, well, we're not sure God, you know, put you down on a carpet into the Rift Valley, but hey, you're there. Right. <laughs> we love the fact that you're there. So on this high altitude areas on the escarpment of the Rift Valley are where some of uh, Kenya's tribes that are famous for long distance running, uh, they're based there, they're located there. So a, a very famous area in Kenya is called E10. So that's I and then T-E-N. And the altitude there, it's, it's very, it's high altitude and a lot of the people from there obviously have great lung capacities and yeah. oh my you should you should see them run so a lot of the the long distance runners are from that rift valley area and that's the, in kenya we classify it as the north rift because it's the south rift which is slightly lower in altitude and a lot of this runners come from this area and they have very rigorous schedules so you get guys looking up at 4 a.m to run about 21 kilometers and wow. it's very lanky guys, very determined guys, because for some of them, um, I mean, when you talk about track and field, you're usually thinking of someone in, you know, in middle school or in, some of them start running from as early as seven and they figure out that, whoa, I'm, I'm this first, this might be my ticket out of, you know, uh, mm. if it's poverty or just, you know, some form of, uh, you know, whatever situation they are in. And so they take it very seriously. So for many of these communities, you would find that, um, the young the young men and women embrace the sport early and this is not really the case for many other communities in kenya but as uh, as, it, as fate has has it there's other communities that have also produced may, uh, phenomenal runners so we have a famous runner who's from the central area called samuel wanjiru he also broke a few re records you guys obviously have probably heard of Eli kipchoge he ran the marathon under two hours yeah He's considered the greatest of all time when it comes to marathon running in Kenya. And I mean, a lot of people really esteem his discipline and his work ethic. He's, he's truly taken the sport to a next level. He's now involved in really pushing out guys to be more active and to take on, you know, uh, to physical exercise. But Kenya is also well known, obviously, uh, apart from the Olympic gold medals it gets in steeplechase. And uh, there's now rugby that's coming up, the sevens rugby. It's um, Kenya's won one of the circuits, the uh, the Singapore Sevens. So it's a, it's a seven circuit that you know the, uh, takes places around different places in the world, and obviously some of the famous and the great nations, obviously New Zealand, uh, Africa's own South Africa, and um, obviously all these other you know there's there's representations from all, all around the world. Uh, but Kenya was, was fortunate enough to take and clinch this uh, cup in Singapore in 2016. So. Oh, wow. you, you could call us out also for rugby, for the okay. seventh rugby. <laughs> On the fifteen, we probably are, you know, less formidable. But um, the we, within the seventh circuit, uh, a lot of people know that Kenya gives them a run for their money. Quite literally, we run. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, we've got, we've got also a very good volleyball team, the women's volleyball team. Um, continentally, we've won some of the continental awards. Uh, we we qualified for the women's World Cup volleyball World Cup, but we didn't get too far. Uh, I think it, we got out in the first stage, first legs or something. But a lot of uh, Kenyans. Uh, so basically, the way you'd have teams that. Uh, I don't know. In, in volleyball, it's it's mostly organizations that sponsor their team. So 
uh, you'd have banks and you'd have, you know, like postal corporation or power states having their, their own teams. So in Kenya, there's famous banks that people just know, you know, the girls team for that bank is really good in volleyball. And you, again, when you mention communities, there's various communities that are also known like, oh, the girls from this community are very good in volleyball. So it's, mm. it's <laughs> like, you know, you get a girl who has like very strong curls and you just know, oh, she's from that community or the other. <laughs> They'll come for me, but we know we. If you know, you know. Kenyans who are listening, they know <laughs> what I'm talking. <doing. laughs> so, um, so apart from volleyball, there's also hockey. Um, a lot of also the sports that uh, are considered British, like cricket. Uh, but this is again played by uh, predominantly the Kenyan Indian community because cricket is also very famous in India. Uh, but there was a time when Kenya was again very good in cricket in the 90s. But an infamous match fixing scandal sort of brought the tempo down, and uh, one of the one of the then famous uh, skippers of the of the, of, of the Kenyan team was, you know, implicated in it. He cl- later cleared his name, but damage was already done. Yeah. Um, let me see any other sports. I think, uh, yeah, we we're trying on all the other fronts, but uh, someone said soccer, and I think we. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call you out on that one. That's the only thing I think Ghana has on Kenya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you and everything. Surprisingly, I, I remember, and this was also shocking to us. Um, so the African Cup of Nations qualifiers, I think, for last last year, 2019, uh, Ghana had a home win in Ghana, but when they came to Kenya, they were thrashed one nil. But it's a thrashing. <laughs> 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 the black stars really didn't have their lucky stars on that day. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and yeah. I think a lot of players were comfortable with the fact that if we beat Ghana, even if we don't qualify for the World Cup, we didn't actually qualify. <laughs> we won a World, we won a World Cup. <laughs> yeah, if we don't qualify, we're good. We're good. Yeah, but the, but this but the but the but the Kenyan uh, football team. Um, we call it the Harambe Stars. Harambe is Swahili for pull together, and then obviously the Stars. Uh, they have had their lucky streaks from time to time. They bring in foreign uh, foreign coaches, and sometimes we've you know the, there's been a hue and cry about you know the, the lack of sort of uh, national uh, or, or can I say Kenyan coaches. But this is the case again. I, I think in major in in all the major teams, they have all these foreign coaches coming in, and. Uh, the rugby team, for instance, had better success with the local coach than with all the foreign coaches. But I think this is not the same sort of uh, luck that has befallen the, mm-hmm. uh, the football team. But uh, we hope it's always a packed stadium, obviously, when Kenya is playing. And, uh, you know, regardless of all the, the match scores, you know, people will still live with uh, a smile that they came in and watched their team play. Uh, a, a couple of guys who've played in the Premier League also. We've got uh, Wanyama, Victor Wanyama is a very famous uh, striker. Um, and uh, I think now he's not in the Premier League anymore. Uh, there's Origi. He's Belgian. He's Belgian, but he's Kenyan. Like, you know, Belgian. Origi. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, uh, some of them really, uh, you know, are, are in their own right, you know, uh, at the top of their class, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's that's, that's definitely great. Um, the uh, yeah, that that definitely. Um, yeah, no. Um, they they actually doing well now. I think they should be able to qualify for the Cup of Nations. Well, it's anyone's guess <laughs> <laughs> because I think the, the, the Harambe stars are definitely doing much better yeah. than before. Yeah. So there's there's a there's yeah. better there's a better hope for the future. I hope so too. Well, I, I want to ask, because we always like to talk a little bit about um, kind of imagery, like the whole concept of this show is to kind of escape Western media imagery of who people are. Mm-hmm. Uh, in looking at media, how do you feel like Kenya is portrayed in the media? And do you feel like it's an accurate depiction or is it completely skewed? Great question. One of the few things that, uh, you know, Kenyans have tried to world overdue whenever they they go is sort of set their own narrative and um, as you've said a lot of what you've heard about Kenya either is in regard to tourism or to sports especially track and field 
but now we're sort of rebranding ourselves as a sort of a Silicon Savannah, as the home of innovation. A lot of you know about the revolutionary mobile transfer, money transfer service, M-Pesa. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is a Kenyan innovation that really has changed uh, you know the the, the, uh, the atmosphere and the, and the landscape of, of, of financial remittances, especially to rural folk who otherwise would have remained unbanked. And for a lot of the mobile phone penetration in, in Kenya, uh, it would have meant nothing if it wasn't of you know tangible uh, benefit to mobile phone holders. And so we have people being able to send money from uh, you know each corner of the country to you know to their friends, relatives, or even business suppliers. And this is one of the things that has made Kenya be a hub for investment. And a lot of investment is now pouring into tech and uh, to solutions and innovations that would help even, you know, in sectors that uh, hitherto were not considered lucrative. For example, like agriculture, nobody thought mm -hmm. of solutions that would be tech based for agriculture. So we've got farmers now knowing when the rains would come, farmers now knowing when the grains are ready to, to for example, for irrigation or to be, uh, to be processed or to be uh, harvested. And this is all Kenyan again technology that's developed by young guys, fresh millennials coming out of high school and they're like, you know, yo, we, we've got something to give. And yeah. this, is this information getting out there and people in the West knowing about this? Unfortunately, no, because the challenge is um, we get one terrorist strike or we get one terrorist attack and that's the news that goes out there. And yeah. As much as it's true that Kenya has really had the, the shorter end of the stick when it came to terrorist attack, and this is mainly because of our interventions in the Horn of Africa. So Somalia, as many of you yeah. know, has been in, uh, in a state of civil strife, and um, Kenya had to send in some of her troops in there under the Amisom uh, uh, Accord. But this, again, made us, again, uh, the primary target because we're neighbors to Somalia. So mm -hmm. uh, we've got a very porous border, and the government was in in an effort to make a border a fence. And I know it sounds Trumpian, but uh, that's what happened. And, uh, <laughs> because of basically the marauding attacks from the Al-Shabaab, which is a, a terrorist outfit uh, emanating from uh, Somalia. Yeah. And um, uh, unfortunately in 2013, we had the unfortunate incident where a university was attacked by some of this um, uh, terrorists and about 147 students lost their life, unfortunately. So some of this news gets out faster than all the other stuff that you know get. We had again uh, last, I think last year there was a, there was a hotel which was again uh, attacked by three terrorists and we had uh, 69 people losing their lives. This is the news that the world media would obviously uh, first of all show uh, and, and for a lot of people who've obviously talked to me about, you know, is Kenya safe? Are, are, I mean, are you always under, you know, uh, terrorist attack? I mean, I would obviously say it's as safe as Paris or as safe as any other of the world capitals because terror, as it, as it were, is never expected. It's, it's yeah. a shock uh, to the mm. system and whichever uh, party is, 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 of course, claiming responsibility obviously wants to, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, destabilize or, or reduce the will of the people to whatever ends that maybe they've chosen to, to take. And so I would never obviously tell people that Kenya is unsafe. And to the best of my, my ability, I'll try to bring people to, to Kenya and to see the beauty of Kenya. You've, you've obviously asked me previously about, uh, for example, our wildlife and, and, and all that. And that's part also of the narrative, you know. Um, yeah. Is Kenya the out of Africa experience that you would obviously see in the National Geo? And mm. we have that. We we and we we're very happy about that. A lot of Kenyans are very uh, patriotic and and very, um, if I could say, they believe in conservation of our animal resources and our wildlife. For example, we truly understand uh, the fact that, for example, you can't um, you can't shoot wildlife. There's some countries yeah. that. That we we are aware of some of the accords, the cities act where you can't trade in ivory. A lot of trophies in Kenya are banned, so you you, you can't wear your tiger or alligator shoes in Kenya. It's it's mm. tiger skin or alligator skin. Yeah. Shoes. You probably would be very bold to do that, but yeah, even if it's fake alligator skin, because you might you know you you might be in for you know questioning. Um, we're very confident that obviously the measures that are being taken to protect the wildlife uh, will make them be there for the continuity and for our generations to come. And um, 
a lot of Kenyans are very, you know, they do not obviously frequent the national parks as they want to because uh, some of them are some distances away from the major uh, areas where they stay in the cities and stuff. But over the holidays, especially Christmas season or Easter, uh, this wild uh, reserves. So we've got two, we've got national parks and we've got national reserves. And now even in Mombasa, we've got marine reserves where you can actually get to see some dolphins and, and very interesting, mm -hmm. you know, um, marine life over there. And wow. the famous one obviously is the Mara and uh, there's a wildebeest migration that happens around September. And this is amazing because the Mara is shared between uh, Kenya and, and, and Tanzania. And as it's dry in the Kenyan side uh, during this period, the wildebeest and a lot of other herbivores want to move to Tanzania. But there's this Mara River, which is infested by crocodiles who are also coming for their annual feast. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's too bad for the wildebeest. You know, some of them got to go, but uh, well, that's part of the reason, you know, the cycle of life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's 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 very interesting that you know you'd find this spectacle only happening in Kenya. I think in some cases it's been ascribed as one of the wonders of the world. Actually, the mm -hmm. yes. migration. Yeah. So that's the kind of that's the kind of narrative that's there around Kenya. Uh, we try as well, especially in the political realm, to 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 show Kenya as an open space, especially for the freedom of expression, the freedom of religion. Our constitutional changes also um, helped a lot in terms of solidifying these freedoms, uh, because prior, as I said, there was the, the, the space was very restricted and uh, it had been a one-party state, and uh, so with the clamor for multi-party democracy and the subsequent change in regimes, uh, we had a constitutional a referendum on a constitutional change and we passed it. And it's given so much freedom. There's so much, uh, you know, delegation of power. It's not very centralized as it was. And there's more authorities that give for checks and balances. And so the, the runaway corruption that had been there under the one party system is now steamed. Of course, the incidents of cor corruption and, uh, but there's more, more accountability. There's uh, there's an anti-corrupt ethics and anti-corruptions commission that you know really goes after the the heads of any of the organizations. They are made to be culpable for any of the uh, things that go on under their their watch. Yeah. Wow! 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 Thanks, man. This is this is so great. Um, yeah. So you, you said you said something that was very interesting. How um, you know the Western media once it's negative and especially coming from the continent it's, it's yeah. always going to come out it's going to hit every news cycle cnn fox news they're going to project it oh yeah you know terrorist mm -hmm. attack but then it happens yeah i mean 911 happened and you know still people are not as scared to come to new york and that's one of the more dangerous cities in the world you know or most of most major cities in the in the states are yeah, so you don't Nairobi has its dangerous spots. I there's some places I would even go in Nairobi. Of course, <laughs> the, same, the same year, same year for I mean every major city. Nobody will walk up into you in Nairobi and you know, like you know, just uh stick up stick you up and be like, you know, hand me over your money. If, yeah. uh, if that's the, the idea of violence or gang violence that's projected, but the chances of I mean of you getting mugged or robbed are as as same as in any other big city. That's what I was projecting. And yeah. uh, as you said, the, the sensationalism that's brought out by uh, big media, world media, over an incident that happened in Africa, obviously it's for, I mean, it's, it's, it's all for the eyeballs. When you look at a news item about Africa, and it's not about the flies on kids' faces or mm -hmm. languishing, people languishing in poverty, or if it's not about the dead strewn over a bomb blast, you won't, you know, you won't stick around for longer you know, than, you know, if you, you, for example, if you, if you had, you know, about something nice happening there, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's wait for the more sensational news. That's how yeah. Western media has, again, programmed uh, oh, yeah. the, of their, of their, of their audience. So it's, it's partly a, a systemic issue rather than just that they seek, they seek to just portray this negative news and outfits such as, for example, the BBC have been doing segments such as the BBC Africa, for instance. Yeah. And this focuses on providing maybe more of this uh, better, if I could say, uh, newsworthy items that have previously not been shown. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. BBC Africa. They even have one where it's BBC in Pigeon. You know, Pigeon English, like the one that's mostly in uh, yeah, West, Africa. Um, West Africa, like Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Gambia. 
and they have the the BBC Pigeon English. You should check that out, Jesse. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I was watching last week. I found out I have a new channel. It's an Africa on Demand channel. And I was watching it, but I got upset because it was uh, showing a, a show about a wedding with over 100 people. There were two black people there and everybody yeah. else was white. And I'm like, well, what is this? So, uh, uh, yeah. That's a demand for Africans. That's how much they need. <laughs> and and let, me, let me just add, you know, I think one of the things that I'm fascinated by when it comes to Western media is there's this cross portrayal, and it seems like it's a portrayal of everybody black, right? So what we hear is for black people in America, the portrayal of us outside of the country is we're criminals. We're trying to come after people's women and take them and all this stuff. And then in, um, in when we get images from the motherland, what we're getting is, you know, there's some old white man that looks like Santa Claus that's going to go out here and <laughs> for five cents a day, save a country, right? And we know that that's not real, but somebody is catering or at least uh, exploiting that imagery for a purpose, right? And so one of the things for this show is we wanted to make sure that folks know, one, you know, if you had met Francisco before, you now know Francisco. He's cool, obviously. <laughs> obviously, yeah. you see, he's not trying to rob us through the thing, right? So obviously, it's not what people try to project all the time. And I think part of that is to keep dialogue, like what we're doing now, from happening so that we don't know about each other. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to push people to you know go out there once outside opens back up and COVID goes away, to get back out here, dust off your passports, go travel, don't believe what people say on TV, yeah. go see what it's like for yourself uh, and form your own opinions. Uh, likewise, you know, Fred was talking about 9-11. We don't even have to go back to 9-11. It was still happening this week. No. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, going exactly. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, terrorist threats can happen at any point in time, anywhere. You shouldn't right. live your life based on that. I think it is smart for anybody who's traveling, even in your own hometown, but wherever yeah. you go, to be cognizant of, like, what's going on around you and be relatively street smart. Um, and then, like you said, if there are places in my own hometown of Durham, I, I grew up in a place that people probably wouldn't want to go through. Right. Yeah. So I understand <laughs> it. I get it. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, most people, if they're going, particularly if they're going to be tourists and they're going, I know most people when they go are doing like touristy stuff, like you're going to see sites. You're not going in there. If you went and you're trying to be the, the old, you know, Santa Claus looking dude, then yeah, you might, you might get it. It's a whole different story, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I appreciate everything that you told us, man. This is this has been really, really uh beneficial, informational. And now I've got people that I've got to look up uh so yeah. I can understand because I didn't even know the that um Britain was trying with had an attempt for colonization in Kenya. Like I knew they screwed my family up, but I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know this was like that Maybe. far deep. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that is very yeah. interesting. Um, I guess they were serious. They said that the sun doesn't set on the British Empire. They were serious about that. Oh um, yeah, they, they were relentless when the back in the yeah. day. Yeah, a <sighs> famous, uh, famous uh, book that you should read if 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 you were interested in the in the Mau Mau uprising. It's the Imperial Reckoning. It's by Carol Elkins. And, okay. Right, right. So basically, this revealed a lot of the human rights abuses that the Brits were doing on um, a lot of the, the the then Mau Mau suspects and had adherents, because in in a bid to try and get everyone to sort of you know give up on, on their fellow uh, Mau Mau. Uh, Oath takers, they would put everyone in, in concentration camps, and a lot of, of, of uh, human rights injustices happened in these concentration camps. And this actually led to a lot of the Mau Mau veterans being awarded a compensation in 2012, mm. I think, or 12, one of these years, by the Brits, because uh, this, I mean, was documented and in, 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 in Britain trying to. Me, uh, uh, what's the name of the book again? I wanted to project Imperial it. Record. Imperial Record. Imperial Record. Imperial Record. Okay, good. And, and, and uh, obviously this this led to a lot of you know uh, questions about how do the British again treat many of the rebels or dissenters during their time 
uh, as, as, as colonizers in, in, in many of their colonies. So that's just maybe an additional uh, reference for some of those who want to know more about Pindar. Absolutely. Well, I've written down. I've got it. <laughs> Do me a little research here. Right. Um, let, let me ask, and this is, yeah. I, I'll, I know I'm going to take all your time. But I, let me ask this. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. I'm talk about. Uh, so Kenya. someone, someone who's coming to Kenya, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody hears about uh, Nairobi and uh, Mombasa. Right. What should be things that they want to go see or places where they should okay. go? Great, great. Coming into Nairobi, obviously, uh, one of the few places you should check out is obviously the Nairobi National Park. So we've got a park right there in the middle of the city. It's 45 minutes away from the city center where you get your big five. That's your uh, your lions and your, your cheetahs and your rhinos. And you know, you've got everything already within 45 minutes of landing. So you don't have to exactly go to the Mara, but if you do definitely get a chance to go to the Mara, you do that. Um, there's obviously the cityscape, there's a lot of street food and you should obviously walk inside Nairobi, feel the hustle and the bustle, feel the vibe of the city. Um, yeah. We've got the various museums and um, Kenya actually uh, for a while was considered the cradle of mankind because a few of the, the paleontological findings uh, were by a famous uh, researcher called Louis Leakey and yep. they found some of, some of this uh, early, uh, early man, the early man's uh, remains in, in part of Kenya called the Turkana region, which is up north. And there was a lot of research that, you know, led to Kenya actually having that title of the cradle of mankind. And so this is in the National Museum of Kenya. Um, We've obviously got also other, you know, little joints and crooks that, you know, it depends on your, it depends <laughs> on, your, on your, on your, on your, on, on your individual preferences. But the giraffe mana in Kenya is one of the famous go-to places. So basically, this is a giraffe uh, rehabilitation center for giraffes whose moms, calves whose moms either died or were sick. And okay. you, you have breakfast here with the giraffe peeking over your shoulder. And you can <laughs> <laughs> It's quite a famous go-to place for a lot of the of the visitors, first-time visitors. Um, there's the Sheldrick's Wildlife Trust, where you can also feed some of these elephant calves. So there's elephants again, which the calves obviously, uh, you know, are being rehabilitated, and you can obviously donate to just help their their, their well-being, but also you can feed them, and you can, you know, just be close to, you know, some of this uh, large animal that you wouldn't get a chance to. Obviously, Mombasa has the, the warm weather and, and, the, and the sandy beaches and obviously the amazing street food. Tropical. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing in terms of also its, um, its music and its vibe. And they have uh, donkey races in one of the areas. And so you can see that and it's the local culture there. The food, the cuisine has a blend of both uh, the Bantu and the Arabic and the Swahili dishes are to die for. Some of uh, Kenya's, you know, it's contested, but some of Kenyan men would be like, you know, the best woman to marry would be from that region because of their dishes. But again, this is... <laughs> I don't know any of them would come for me, but I know you guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the, man, the way to a man's heart is through through his stomach. Through his stomach. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we know you guys. So it's 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 something again that's uh, that's been considered a you know delicacy. Some of their foods and some of their snacks. Yeah. Okay. A, parts of the country. There's, there's a Rift Valley, as I mentioned. We've got some freshwater lakes. We've got uh, the there's flamingos, a very beautiful lake in the Rift Valley called Lake Naku. And you've got, you know, amazing flamingos there. And you've got obviously the Lake Victoria, which is a source of the Nile. Uh, yeah. the there's amazing. And the community there as well is very welcoming. Uh, you've got Lake Trucana, which is near where I said the fourth were found. And this is a place again where uh, there's there's an island in there which you can go by boat and there's amazing resorts and beautiful wildlife over there, beautiful communities. Some of these communities obviously are indigenous to that area, so a lot of their traditional rites and passages are also still being contained. The Maasai, uh, it's amazing to see how they still live, you know, in their in the 21st century, still living with their indigenous practices. Uh, the, the warrior initiation ceremonies, they would invite some of the tourists to see some of how their lives are. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to see some of these tribes and 
I mean, a lot of them are obviously embracing modernity and urbanization and leaving to go into, into towns. But for uh, some of them who've retained this, it's it's very it's very just fulfilling to see the traditional African culture in its in its natural form. Yeah. So, tell me, what's the? Uh, I had the privilege of of living by a, a lady, a Ghanaian lady who had been to, had grown up in Eastern Africa, in Kenya and in Tanzania. So she, she used to make ugali and I had a, a chance of eating. So where's the best ugali? Where can you find the best? <laughs> I'm going to get you in trouble here again. <laughs> because I actually come from the community that makes it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Luya, which is, uh, it's the second most popular tribe in Kenya. Oh, yeah. And oh, okay. in, um, so, so the Bantu have, uh, have in Kenya, the, 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 the tribes, the 43 tribes, they fall into what are called the Bantu, the Nilots, or the Kushites. And so a lot of the Bantu tribes actually have maize as their staple food. And so the derivative, the maize flour or dry maize or, or, or a mixture of maize and beans form the different staple foods for the different ethnic ethnic tribes. So for my tribe, the Luya, we are very famous for loving chicken and ugali. So ugali is a, is a mix, it's almost like a hard porridge. It's a mixture of maize flour and, and water. And the recipe is basically simple, boil the water, put the fly in and knead with all your life. So basically, <laughs> so you want to make a strong, you know, need, you want to knead it until it's a strong sort of cake. And uh, for a lot of people who taste it for the first time, they feel it as a bit bland because it's, it's basically flour and water. But for when you mix it with a, with a good stew, chicken stew, meat stew, or just some, deli some, some delicious finger vegetables, we call them finger vegetables because they might be considered herbs in, uh, in other regions, but in, in Kenya, if you mix them right, you make the right salsa to go with it, it's ultimately delicious. A lot of Kenyans also love nyama choma, which is basically barbecue. And this goes well, especially in Christmas and the Christmas period and festive period. It, it goes well with ugali. So a lot of people would always look forward to having ugali with whatever meal they have. And if in my community, if you don't cook for them ugali, they'll be like, hey, we haven't eaten. We haven't eaten. <laughs> <laughs> However, what you do, you do a rice dish, you do spaghetti or pizza. They're like, "Where's the ugali?" So we, <laughs> we really, <laughs> we're really pushing up that narrative, man. The ugali, no, no ugali, no food. Like no, like we haven't eaten yet. They haven't eaten yet. They eat ugali. <laughs> well, that's also common in uh, in Ghana in the particular ethnic group. The Ashanti, when uh, some of yeah. them said if. If they eat rice, like they haven't eaten, they have to eat some fufu before. No, yeah. no, they eat. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. okay, and then we, have, we actually have a similar one, Banku. Yeah. I don't know what you've heard of Banku. Oh my but goodness, I've a chance to hide it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah. But it's, a, it's a bit, uh, can that I say more? Uh, yeah. yeah, that one's, um, the difference is that one's fermented into the, uh -huh. you know, okay. you know okay. yeah, it's the fresh, no, to, each, to each his own, I would never, <laughs> I, I, would never I, I would never question how much you love Banku because <laughs> I know if, if I had half as much as your culture, I would be fighting for rights of my Banku. <laughs> as I'm fighting for the rights of Ugali to be recognized as my dish. <laughs> so Mala, yeah, Mala Dutch says Sawa Muya. So that's colloquial for right on, Luya guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right on. Oh, okay. Yeah, he figured out. He figured out that I'm. I'm sort of gassing up my my community's favorite dish, and she's just playing on me. <laughs> yeah, she says. She says, tell them the whole truth, Liam. <laughs> Liam, man, don't consider right. <laughs> she don't get that bad, right. <laughs> Thank you, my lad. I can't wait. I could just see my my palate, my menu is going to be so big once I start traveling because. I don't know if y'all know, like our our food here is very, very different. High starch. I'm in the South, so it's a lot of fried foods. Uh, that's why I was thumbs up with barbecue because I grill all the time. Uh, so, so um, you know, but we have a lot of fried foods, a lot of stuff that's just not good for you, uh, but it's usually dirt cheap. Uh, so that's, that's what people eat. If you like fried chicken, if you like collard greens, macaroni and cheese, 
that's kind of our thing. It's good. It's tasty, but you probably won't make it long. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I've heard about of, about Southern hospitality and how grandmas yes. won't let you get out of that, you know, Thanksgiving dinner without a third plate, second plate, yes. fifty carving. I don't know. They really want you to, you know, get on that those inches around your belly before yes. you eat. <laughs> Kind of like what would what would be your case as well with a Louis your mom? They would be like, no, you haven't eaten enough. When you come back from wherever, you're like, why are you so thin? And you're like, I think I gained a few pounds. But you know, they all, your mom will always think you're thin at any time you yeah. go back home. And they would try to feed you off, you know, whatever they, they're making, twice as much. And yeah, yeah, it's, yeah story of our lives. That's cool. awesome. Cool. That is awesome. All right. So I think uh, we'll have to go on and on, but we've, been a little over time today. Thanks oh, wow. a lot, Francisco, for coming. We've been uh, you've, you've been a wealth of information. Thanks yes. for all the history lessons. The you know putting Kenya on the map. You know that was such a great time. It's been a great time with you. So make sure this video is going to be up on YouTube later today. Make sure you subscribe, like, comment, share the share this video. And, um, you know, when you like and comment, it gives our videos a boost. So please do though. So please do so. Uh, Jesse, you close us out. Yes. Uh, for those of you who have not done so already, make sure that you follow us either on Facebook uh, or now on Instagram. Instagram. So Instagram at the Pan Africana Show. Uh, follow us, comment to us. If you are a Black person and you live somewhere where people are not, uh, people have not had the opportunity to converse with you. Reach out to us, please. We want to make sure that everybody is represented. We don't want to leave any country out. Um, and so just reach out to us, send us a message, and I'll get in contact with you uh, and see. Or you can do like the route that Francisco took and have somebody else dodge us <laughs> and put your name up uh, for the person to contact. I'm happy to contact uh, anybody to, to get us there. We're going to be posting more and more content on the Instagram page in 2021 as we move forward, uh, all in the hopes of, again, continuing to build bridges across the diaspora. Uh, it's been a great show. It's a great opportunity. Thank you, Francisco, for your time. And uh, we will see everybody next week. Same time, same place. That's right. Bye, everyone.